to first uh, Andrea Marie Breiling, who is a fantastic, incredible painter who, if you haven't seen it, has a show, I think, perhaps one of the best off-fair shows in Miami I've ever seen at 5811 North Miami Avenue. It's an incredibly special space. What I've heard, it's a decommissioned um, Cuban embassy which has been filled with paintings suspended from the ceiling, and the paintings themselves are just incredible. Um, we have work by Andrea in ICA's collection, and we're so proud to have her here. Um, I all our second panelist is Alex Whitkoff, um, who is an ICA Miami trustee and a veritable force of nature. Um, he is the co-chairman of, co-CEO of the Whitkoff Group, which is a global development real estate conglomerate <laughs> company. And within his vision for this company, which has multiple exciting projects across Florida, Los Angeles, New York, residential mixed-use hotel, he has an, a unique and forward-thinking vision for how art plays into our community. Alex is an incredible collector, has a work of Andrea's as well in his collection, one of the other great connections between these speakers. Um, and is a supporter of culture in Miami. He's also on the Young Leadership Group for the Milken Institute. Um, he has lots of great things to share with us. I want to also acknowledge um, AIG Private Group and uh, then begin turning over to my very dear friend, Sarah Harrelson, who is no longer with us in Miami Beach, and we're so sad about it, and is leaving to threatening to leave tonight. 
but um, is the founder, editor of Cultured Magazine, worked with us to put together this incredible talk, and um, also did put together with Fairchain and Charlie a portfolio of four up-and-coming collectors who are transforming the Miami scene. And I'm very proud and bragging that all four of them are on ICM Miami's Board of Trustees. So for that, I am thankful for letting Sarah, letting Sarah let me influence her. Sarah Harrelson. Thank you, Alex. Um, it's amazing to be in Miami, and I just want to thank Jamie Mark and Soho House. Um, I think this is one of the best settings during such a crazy week to have a talk. Um, I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Cultured Magazine. We have the new issue here. Um, supporting people like Alex and collectors and artists is kind of at the core of our mission. Um, as Alex said, I have left Miami, but I was lucky enough to watch what you've done at the ICA uh, firsthand, and it's, it's really incredible. Hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, to see you foster more patrons in Miami, like Alex, and We okay here? Is it me? No, you're perfect. Sorry. Um, and before I uh, introduce uh, Charlie, the co-founder of Fairchain, I just want to speak for a second about Andrea. Um, I think we first met in 2017. Um, that was when I first came across her, I call them like mesmerizing abstractions. I'm sure people have seen her work, but it's, it's incredible, and it's kind of gone from strength to strength to strength. And we covered her, I think, in 2017, and again in 2021. And it's been an honor to watch you grow, and great to have this panel with you today. Um, Alex, thank you for all you do for Miami. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce another female founder, Charlie, a y very young one. Um, and she has the platform uh, that I'm incredibly impressed with called Fair Chain, uh, aiming to give more clarity in the art world, which is, I think, something that we all are for. Um, it's also very pro-artist and helps artists be a part of the secondary market, which I think is so important. So thank you everyone for being here today. I'm sorry about this mic. Hope we can get it fixed before you guys start. And um, enjoy. Charlie? Hello everyone. My name is Charlie and I'm the co-founder of Fairchain. Um, a little bit about Fairchain, it is, I'm doing something wrong, okay. Um, Fairchain is a title management and transaction platform for fine art. We allow artists in their galleries to create digital certificates of title and authenticity for their works um, and remain connected to their works as they move through the market. Um, one of the things that's really, I don't know if I'm are these working? I think they're fine. Is this out? You could use mine, I can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. One of the things that's really important to us um, is providing a framework to allow for people who are lucky enough to own works to be not just collectors, but patrons and stewards of the work and also the artists um, who have put so much time and energy into creating the works. Um, so we were really happy to work with ICA and Cultured on this panel, and I'm so thrilled um, to have Andrea and Alex here today, um, an amazing artist and an amazing collector. Um, and yeah, I'm excited for us to talk. This is my first time moderating a panel. Um, I've been watching a lot of Oprah to practice. <laughs> so bear with me. At the very end, we'll have questions open to the audience, um, but I get to start. So. First, I will have the two of you introduce yourselves. So, Andrea, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? I'm prepared for that question. <laughs> um, thank you for being here. Um, my name's Andrea. You can say it like five ways, but it's actually Andrea. And um, I'm represented by Night Gallery, and um, Davida Nemiroff, who's here right now, was my first. Uh, person who saw a vision in me, and um, I'm forever indebted to you, side note. But anyway, so her and I um, collaborated on the show. I hope all of you can go see it. It's very special. And, um, and I currently work with spray paint. Sure. 
Alex Whitkoff. Um, I actually reside in Miami Beach. Actually came here from New York about two years ago. Real estate during the day. So we have a big real estate company called Whitkoff Group, which is a developer of residential and hospitality projects all throughout major markets in New York, Miami, and Los Angeles. Uh, also, I parade into art, but I won't try to preempt too much your future questions, but very passionate about art. A, a, on the board of the ICM Miami, which I think is one of the most exciting museums in the country, and really excited to be here today. Thank you, guys. Um, so we will talk a little bit more about um, your practice as an artist and yours as a collector, but first I wanted to hear a little bit about the beginning of both of your journeys. Um, Andrea, I would love to hear about how you start off as an artist, and more specifically, when um, and how you knew you wanted to even be an artist in the first place. Sorry if these questions are hard, <laughs> I just want to know. <laughs> nervous, so bear with me. Um, I would say ever since I was a little girl, I was raised in a family, um, a single parent, single mother, young, and my grandmother was really the nurturer of me, and she's a storyteller. Um, she, uh, I was raised around a bunch of puppets, and she would tell me stories with puppets, and she was a quilt maker, so, um, and uh, she would read to me um, I'm blanking on the name of the book because I wasn't prepared for this question. But uh, I think it's Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Um, and it really, uh, we would practice a lot from this book and there was a lot of abstract exercises that you would do in it. And she would have me like scribble lines and then I'd have to fill in each like empty scribble um, and she would make me make every other like empty spot different or it wouldn't pass. So if it was like like dots, then it had to be lines. And so I think it, it was just, it was just in me since the time I was a little girl. Nurtured from my family, I would say. Very cool. Um, and Alex, did you grow up in a family of collectors or how did you get into collecting originally? Sure, actually no, uh, but we had a very, uh, ironic or interesting way of uh, foray into the art world. So in a lot of our projects, actually, we do public art commissions. So we built a project, the West Hollywood Edition, which was the first ground up edition hotel in the United States. And as part of that project for the city of West Hollywood, which is really looking to promote arts and culture in the city of West Hollywood, we actually commissioned a public uh, art sculpture by Sterling Ruby. So super exciting, a d dynamic artist who is both in sculpture, painting, even produces his own clothing. Um, and he produced a mobile inspired by Alexander Calder uh, in, 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 as part of the lobby for that hotel. And from that, actually, he was having a show at Gagosian on Madison Avenue. And I acquired two works. One was one of his window paintings, and one was a ceramic piece. And funny enough, two months later at the ICA Miami, Alex Gardenfeld was doing the first full survey of Sterling Ruby's work which featured all his sculpture as well as his paintings. It was a very, very iconic and really, really exciting exhibition. And as part of that, uh, we lent one of the window paintings to that uh, survey of his work, and it became met with Alex Gardenfeld as well as Irma Brayman, uh, the original founder and benefactor of the IC in Miami. Um, and then from there, I joined the board, and my collection grew, and my interest in art uh, continued to proliferate. And how did you first discover Andrea's work? I'm curious. So I'd love to say I found it, but actually Alex Gardenfeld turned me on to it. He gives me most of my best ideas, but I think her work is super, super exciting, and I'm quite particular in which artists I collect. But I think what the two things I find most exciting about artists I collect is one, I always believe in doing what you love, buying what you love, and her work is visually and aesthetically very pleasing and attractive, and it keeps getting better and better. But two, is really finding artists who have a signature thumbprint, right? So you always see her work, and it's always uniquely identifiable as an Andrea Maria uh, Breiling. I think what characterizes her work that's so exciting, you can see on the screen, is the sinuous curve. So she works with spray paint, but most people who actually see her work don't actually think it's spray paint. They think it's paintbrush because of how deliberate and si the sinuous curves and how hard that is to do with spray paint. 
and two is the scale of the work. Actually, mine is smaller. It's 96 by 84. I actually tried to get another one, so if I say enough nice things today, maybe I'll get a second. Uh, but her works are all only presented on a really large scale, which is quite unique. So they're almost corporal in the way you experience them and you in almost inhale them. Um, but you can see it's the kinetic uh, quality of the work, the way she kind of throws herself throws herself physically into the work. It's really quite unique, and the work keeps getting stronger and stronger. The show at Villa Paul, I think, is certainly the most exciting show people are talking about this week. Yeah, I, I absolutely love your work, and I think it's so incredible the way that you use medium, especially spray painting, to create these um, incredible, incredible works. I would love to hear, and if anyone hasn't been yet, there's a incredible show up right now in Little Haiti of Andrea's works. It's open until the 4th, um, so if you haven't been, you should make sure to check it out. I would love to hear about how you landed on this medium and developed kind of the practice as it is now. I would say I had a show in 2000, my very first solo show was Night Gallery in 2018, I believe. And um, it was, it ended up, I made like 15 works, but I only wanted to show four. Um, I wanted to make a really powerful impact and um, it and it ended up working well that way. But um, they were all made with a brush and <coughs> I do believe that all art is emotional, um, but I think for abstraction there's, uh, we get kind of pigeonholed um, and it's, it's hard to like um, pivot from that and to get people to see something else other than just that, especially when it is abstraction specifically. So these works were made with a brush, um, very abstract. <laughs> I think uh, the reason why I bring up the word emotional is a lot of people are saying they look very emotional, very intense, very physical. And there was a lot of conversations around, uh, conversation around de Kooning and um <coughs> Okay, well, uh, um, and at that point, I started realizing that I wanted people to, to actually uh, take away or have an experience from my work other than just a historical reference. And I felt like the only way that I could really do that was like removing the brush. And yet, I, I didn't know how. So um, I took some time off and I traveled to Mexico City. Um, and I started, I started looking at uh, Morris Lewis and <coughs> Helen, Helen Frankenthaler and um, a bunch of, of <coughs> painters that were doing work similar to that. And um, I started pouring and dyeing fabric and I left Mexico City with nothing. It was, I, I think I have paintings there that didn't translate into anything. And I just kept pushing. And um, when I was in grad school, I was working with spray paint, but not to this extent. And I, someone ha had asked me if they could borrow whatever spray paint I had. And I had lent them like a box of spray paint. And when I got back from this sort of journey of me trying to discover a way to remove the brush, it was very interesting because this person had dropped off this box of spray paint to my studio, like returned it. And um, I was like, wait, maybe there's something here. Maybe I can use this in a different way. And, and that's when it all sort of started happening for me. And um, I started slowly removing everything else. And it just became just the spray paint. Um, becoming sort of like an expert in tips and using um, different layering techniques. And whenever I'm go shop for spray paint, people ask what my tag name is, and things like this. So yeah, it's been an interesting journey, but um, that's how. Thank you. Um, next, I want to make sure we talk a little bit about uh, the ICA Miami. I know your works are actually in the ICA Miami, which is incredible. Um, and the ICA uh, here has done such a good job of, of finding really uh, great talent um, that really pushes the boundaries, in my opinion, of mediums, and, um, and your work is no exception. Uh, Alex, you're intimately involved with the ICA, um, and I'd love to hear kind of 
how you feel. I'm, I'm based in New York, and so I'd love to hear how you feel about the art scene um, in Miami and what you guys ho hope to bring um, to it through the ICA Miami. Sure, so I think what the ICA has done is really quite exciting. You know, going back even before the ICA was founded, what Miami was really known for even was less for museums, but no, more for private collections like the De La Cruz collection or the Margulies collection, which, which is very interesting and a great representation of people who have amazing collections, but they really didn't have a prominent contemporary art museum like the ICA Miami has. So it's been a really welcome and needed thing to the Miami art scene. What I think really characterizes the ICA Miami that makes it so innovative and novel that Alex Gardenfeld has done over there uh, is n no exhibition is a repeat from something seen at MoMA or the Whitney or you know MoCA in Los Angeles. Everything is a first of. So when he did Sterling Ruby, it was the first survey of his work. Uh, he's now there's a really exciting show there by Michelle Mayeris, who's an overlooked artist from the 1990s, and now it's the 20th anniversary of his death. Um, who is a really exciting artist who mixes both painting and digital imagery. Um, and now it inspired a whole series of German uh, museums to actually put on shows of his work as well. Um, there's a contemporary artist, Jade Faruchimi, who uh, had her first uh, museum show, even though smaller, at the ICM Miami. So every single thing they do is first of, and it brings a lot of originality and novelty to the Miami art scene. Uh, even Andrea Marie Breiling, it was the first uh, museum to acquire her work. So, and now look how popular she is. So. Yeah. It's quite exciting what they've done uh, for this Miami art scene. I talk to a lot of artists who uh, really dream about having their works in an institution. Um, and I'm really curious about what it's like for you to um, be fortunate to have your work collected um, and or acquired by the ICA in Miami. Um, how did the relationship start and what does it mean to you? Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I think, honestly, uh, I don't think it was ever anything that I thought about being an artist, you know? I mean, I, I make work, and I love what I do, and I think the art, I mean, no offense, Alex, thank you. I <laughs> really appreciate being collected by a museum, but I don't think that's some, a reason why I do what I do, and it's um, it's just a, an element of the art world, you know, um, and it's just part of it. Uh, especially if you're looking to <coughs> have a conversation with artists that are already dead and the ones that are alive, like it's part of our responsibility to have our work be archivable and saved and and uh, respected and taken care of in the right way. Um, but I kind of leave that up to my galleries. And I just like go to the studio and do what I need to do there. And um, hopefully people uh, are impacted by it and like it. And a museum is one way to see it, you know, but there's other ways too. So, I mean, I hope I answered your question. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful, but um, I, don't think, I don't think most artists think about that when they're starting their careers, yeah. you know? I think it just becomes a part of it. That makes sense to me. And so I'm curious about when it comes to growing your career as an artist, what types of support uh, do you feel really meaningful to you? I mean, I know, I know you and Alex are friends, um, not good enough friends to give him the size of painting that he wants. <laughs> <laughs> um, so are you asking me what, uh, what relationships are meaningful? Yeah. Oh, I would say your friends and other artists and the people that have just believed in you from the beginning. Like, I'm lucky my relationship with my dealer um, I f has grown into a friendship and that she, she, she just believed in me when, like, nobody knew who I was and she was interested in what I was doing and she saw something in me. And that's the kind of relationship I think is important. Um, and then along the way, you get people that are really excited about you and they happen to be collectors, and you build a relationship with them too. And I don't know, I just think that it needs to come about in an organic, authentic way. Um, because, you know, tomorrow I might not make this. And um, you just need to have someone 
with you that's willing to take you on through the times when you're going through discovery and it might not be what everyone likes and what everyone wants. Um, and that patience and that like having that sort of um, companion with someone that be just believes in whatever turn you're taking, even if it's not the popular one, I think is the most important. That's a really great point. Um, I think it's interesting. There's definitely a bunch of different approaches you can take to collecting. And when I think about Miami, I think about how it's very much this art scene that's taken very kind of responsible approaches to the way that collectors are engaging with the artists in their community. Um, Alex, I'd love to hear about your approach to um, being a patron to the artists who uh, you support. Sure. So we kind of, I think about the artists I collect, we actually develop relationships with them, which are quite exciting. So I mentioned Sterling Ruby, I acquired two of his works, and then we also put a really important um, sculpture in his home in uh, California. He lives in Vernon. Um, similarly, we bought a work by Sarah Z, who's a really exciting sculptor and painter. Uh, she's the first new artist in Storm King Art Center in over a decade. Um, and then we built a project in Santa Monica, the former site of the Fred Siegel, and we commissioned her to do two split stones, which is one of her most iconic motifs for her sculptures. So she found these boulders in Wisconsin, believe it or not, cut uh, uh, with it resin, created an image of Santa Monica within them, uh, cut them in half, they're nine feet tall, and then they served as gates as you walked in through the residential building. So um, also, I found it quite interesting to collect younger artists and really watch their careers develop and grow, um, such as Andrea Marie Breiling, another artist, Chase Hall, who I collect, um, actually also heard about through Alex Gardenfeld. Uh, but, you know, I acquired his work a few years ago when we was at a smaller gallery. Now he's represented by David Kordansky. What really distinguishes his work is he, act, he uses a lot of what you would think is white paint, but he actually, it's not white paint, it's unprimed cotton canvas. And a lot of the pigment from his work comes from coffee. Um, coffee and cotton are obviously both references to darker ages in African American culture and so forth. So, um, and now he's now at multiple museums. He's collected by the IC Miami, which was I think the first museum to acquire his work, as well as the Whitney. So I always find it really exciting in my collection to find artists and really watch their uh, you know trajectory and their growth. And Andrea is a really exciting example. Look at this exciting show she's doing in Miami this week. Oh, sorry. And Paul, how are you doing on time? Just checking, I want to go over. <laughs> um, okay, and so you collect um, Andrea's work, you collect Chase Hall's work. Um, what other artists are in your collection and what's your vision for your um, kind of ideal way you grow that collection? Sure, so I, my collection has a lot of different avenues to it. Obviously we have some more established artists like a Sarah Z or a uh, Sterling Ruby um, and so forth. but. Recently, I've been very into collecting uh, more contemporary artists, kind of at the start, who I feel are undervalued and then watching um, their careers blossom. So another exciting artist that also Alex introduced me to was Tao Lewis. Um, she works a lot with found objects and recycled materials. Um, so she's what I find so fascinating about her work is she's one of the few artists to work with tapestry, but actually make them figurative in nature. And this past year, she was both in the 59th Venice Biennale, she has an exciting show right now up at 52 Walker, which is um, an affiliate of David Zwarner Gallery. So it's really exciting to see what happened uh, with her as well. Another artist um, I collect who's also within the ICA Miami collection is Genesis Tremaine, who is a expressionist artist who works with, who's inspired by her religious and divine background. Um, so she creates these abstract uh, portraits of divine figures, so referencing biblical um, figures, but it has almost like a Basquiat or George Kondo quality to her work. So um, thankfully, I think what's really hard when you're collecting emerging artists is really knowing, you know, the right artist and um, who to really collect and who has the, you know, kind of right trajectory because you're working with less established artists at times. Um, but what I found is really exciting is being on the IC in Miami, which I think has acquired 700 works in the past three years, or the, probably the most prolific collection of contemporary art right now, probably in the country, is really getting a window into all the artists that the museum's acquiring or who are doing shows at the museum and really being inspired by the work they do and uh, seeking them out for my own collection. And how else do you discover work? So you, uh, 
Alex seems like a, a good vessel for you to discover works. Um, but how do you find these works, and what do you? How would you describe these like right works to collect? Sure. So I spent a lot of time, obviously, going to art fairs or Basel this week, Freeze in Los Angeles. Obviously, there's great. Uh, there's now a great with our Basel, and now this is the 20th anniversary. I think there's over now 100 art galleries in Miami, like Nina Johnson Gallery. There's great galleries in New York, so I spent a lot of time going to them, like. Uh, David Zwerner, or Mendez Wood, or Almin Rush, uh, where Andrea shows with as well. The Night Gallery in Los Angeles, which is a really exciting gallery that I've acquired multiple works from. Um, so I spend lots and lots of time going to art fairs, museums, on my free time. I find it quite inspiring. Um, and I will open it up to questions soon, but I, I really want quickly want to just ask uh, one more question to Andrea. Um, So for you and your journey, um, what has been kind of like the most interesting thing of, uh, I so I'm sorry, I keep asking you hard questions, um, but what has been one of the most interesting things about growing your career as an artist and what has surprised you the most about um, entering and rising in this world? I mean, it's, there's a lot, but something that comes to mind right now would be um, how <coughs> how nice it is that there's so much room for growth and to for an artist to rediscover themselves, and like that someone can can like particular artists like Sterling Ruby's new works, um, for instance, comes to mind. Someone who I was curious about what he was up to, where he had been, what was going on with his practice. And then you see these insane videos of him on the floor, just physically like rubbing in oil pastel sticks and coming up with this brand new body of work. And I, I think that in some strange way, with all of the art forms that there are in this world, that art is really ageless. Um, like I'm talking like as far as like number, how old you are. You can be 80 as an artist and rediscover yourself and be presented into a gallery and it could be the hottest show that you'll see that year, even if there's a 20 year old coming out of college. and. Um, I think that's really, really a special place for us as artists to be, uh, to know that like we have our whole life to con continue to discover and um, to experiment and to make new things and the world will just be here. Collectors, uh, curators, museums, galleries will just, will, will be there for you if you make something exciting and you know the right people and you know, that comes up. I think that's the most surprising thing for me. And what's one piece of advice you'd give to a younger version of yourself? A younger version of myself? Yeah. Oof. Uh, eat healthier. <laughs> Do less harmful things to your body. Party less. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's a physically taxing job. Um, and it takes a lot of work. And um, I think when you're a young artist, you're in your studio and there's this romance with like having the wine, having the beer, staying up all night, not sleeping, you know, uh, making 10 paintings in one night and none of them survive, you know? Um, and, and then you're out and you're with your friends seeing shows and it just, it catches up to you. And um, it is, I do believe that good artists are athletes it's a very, very, very physical, taxing, and emotional business and uh, career to be in. And so, yeah, I don't know how that would work, <laughs> how you would tell a 20-year-old just to like hold back on that, because it's part of it too, but um, yeah. It's a marathon, so not a sprint. Yeah, I'll yeah. I'll answer that from another perspective, yeah. if you don't mind. So I think from a collection perspective, if you look at it, great collections are built over long periods of time. 
Same thing with great art is built, you know, over long, long periods of time of hard work. So the Brahmins, who are the, probably the chief, probably yeah, the most prominent or one of the most prominent art collections in the United States, they built their collection over 40 years. And Andrea, while she's having this amazing moment in popularity now, she put years and years and years, I'm sure, of extremely hard work to get to where she is. So it's really easy to see people after they become successful and not realize the tons of work it took for them to become as successful as they are. It's, th it's not just innate talent, right? It's also harnessing it through hard work. So great collections are built over long, long, long periods of time. Great artists, you know, prosper after long, long times of hard work. And I'm gonna, because Andrea doesn't brag about her work enough, so I'm gonna I give was, her one compliment. <laughs> So, um, you know, there's other artists who work with spray paint who are quite renowned, like Sam Gilliam, who's a super exciting artist, um, one of the more forefront one of my artists with color. For sure. He's amazing in the way he works with canvas. Sterling Ruby, while he does different mediums, he's probably most um, best known for his spray paint works. Katarina Grosse, who's a German artist. But if you look at her work compared to all theirs, which I think is really important in art today, it looks nothing like it, right? The way the, how, how she articulates all the line work, almost like paintbrush strokes with spray paint. It's super impressive and really, really difficult to do. And it really allows her to carve out her own individual identity within spray paint as a medium. So it's super exciting. Thank you, that's very sweet. I, I do, it is, it is a challenge when I'm trying to, uh, I will say this quickly before I, what I was gonna say. It is a challenge to sort of like seek out people for advice on like tips and what kind of spray paint they use and how they layer and stuff because there aren't many artists who work this way. So I am sort of discovering it on my own right now. Um, and, but that's that. But I, what I was gonna say is that um, you asked me what I would tell my younger self, but uh, what the first thing that came to mind was like, get a personal trainer. I was like, just, just like stay, like, uh, I was, I mean, the, I have three 10 by 11 feet paintings in this new show, and, you know, you can't have people around you all the time. Like, I need to be alone when I'm making work, so even if there are people helping me in the studio, assistants or a partner or whatever, I have to kick them out because I need to be by myself to really concentrate and understand where I'm at when I'm doing. So I'm dragging 10-foot paintings around the studio, and they have, like, uh, metal, you know, metal uh, framings and um, whatnot. So I'm tired. If you guys can't <laughs> tell, <laughs> it's been a long week. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna ask the same hard question to Alex now. Um, so you are very much not just a collector; you are a patron of um, the artists in your collection and the ICA Miami. Um, and I would love to know what advice you would give to your younger self now. Um, around how to build um, an important collection um, and how to be uh, an important supporter uh, to the artists that you work with? Sure, so two part question. So I'll answer the mm -hmm. first part on how to build an important collection. I think very much echoing what I said before, it's a marathon, not a race, right? So really um, not, you don't have to buy 100 works in you know, one month, right? But it's really about seeking the artists who you're inspired by, who's uh, work you're excited about, whose work you love, and building it over time. Great collections, just like great art, are built over long periods of time of finding the correct artists, um, the best examples of their work, um, and really allowing it all to come together. Um, so in terms of you know, artists and relationships and being a great patron of art, I think what's really exciting is you know, for it to be a two-way relationship, both to collect a great art like an, you know, Andre Marie Breiling or Sarah Z or you know, really prominent artists, but then also to you know, do an amazing public sculpture by Sarah Z in Santa Monica that the public can experience. Or at our Project 111 Murray, we did a public sculpture by Joel Morrison, who's a, who's a really exciting sculptor as well. Or with Sir Sterling Ruby, not just to acquire his work, but to do a mobile in West Hollywood in an amazing, really cool and exciting hotel. So really to allow it to be a two-way relationship. And then there's been really exciting artists whose work we've helped uh, introduce to the IC in Miami and into museum collections, which is a really nice tribute to, um, to Andrea's work. And as she said, she doesn't always think about being in a museum collection, but to be in a museum like IC in Miami, it's a really great um, endorsement for the quality and the institutional um, renown of her work. Thank you, guys.
Um, I'm definitely inspired. I hope this is uh, helpful for both artists, collectors alike. Um, and now we come to the exciting part. We're going to open up the floor for questions. All right, it's competitive. Um, we're going to start over here. <laughs> Charlie, I'm really curious, um, maybe you could put it into context, um, how the whole fair chain works. Like, let's say as a collector, I was going to buy one of Andrea's paintings today. How is it tracked and what's the process? Thank you. Yeah. Um, fair chain allows artists to create certificates of title for their works that live digitally. Um, so uh, Andrea basically could create a certificate of title for her work. She takes a few images of her work and enters the work details. Um, and then when you want to acquire work, she's able to send you a sales agreement directly to your email. Um, she can set a commission to be collected on any future resales of the work, um, which is very, very important in our opinion. Um, and after you sign the sales agreement, you'll get a digital certificate of title in your account and it has provenance that goes directly back to the artist. Um, the certificate is signed by the artist and when you resell the work, um, we make sure that a percentage of that future uh, transaction value is directed back to the artist. Um, yeah. Over here. Okay. Two-parter for Alex. Uh, for, uh, part one, uh, what personality traits have you observed most consistently in great collectors? And secondly, um, what do you think the impact might be if the step up in basis on tangible assets is removed? The impact on the market in general. Sure, so um, you know, the first question, question in terms of traits of great collectors, I think there's a, there's a strong patience to them. They're also great knowledge and learners, right? I have a big believer in, you know, no one's born out of the womb being a great artist while they may have certain, you know, Im you know natural really great abilities. Um, everyone gets better things through time. So one is um, an intense ability to learn quickly, focus on things, uh, go to art fairs, go to museums, talk to you know interesting and smart and knowledgeable people, and really is you know really acquire knowledge on it. Right, that's important to be knowledgeable. And two is patience. Right, not just lunging at something to you know get to X amount of uh, artworks by a certain period of time, but to really um, over time really buy the best examples of the artists who you think are. The, you know, the best artist and really focus on being disciplined to only buy the best versions of their work. So you sound like Andrea, every work tends to be pretty good, but then there's certain artists where there's better examples of their work and, you know, less good examples of the work that really focusing on the prime, prime, prime quality. In my opinion, over time, those tend to be more valuable. Um, as it pertains to tax consequences, obviously everyone, you know, thinks with their wallet at times, right? Whether, you know, museum donations and donating art and having it appraised and so forth. So um, it's hard not to think of it from a financial perspective, but um, look, art, the art market's been strong over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And um, while there's also an aesthetic equality, you're buying something great in your home, there's also the financial component. So even with that, that may impact the financial um, uh, component of donating art and so forth. Um, you know, I still think the value of art will continue to proliferate. Paul. Got a question probably more for Alex. Um, with respect to Miami and the arts landscape here, how have you seen that change over the past five years or so and where do you see it going forward? Sure, I'll answer that maybe even more broadly. I think Miami has probably undergone the biggest transformation of any city in the United States over the past five years. I think the influx of human capital is pretty unprecedented. You have companies moving headquarters here like Citadel, one of the most important financial services firms. You have law firms moving here like Kirkland and Ellis, taking big spaces, 120,000 square feet. And it's literally changed everything. You have every single restaurateur wants to be here from Thomas Keller to Milo's to major food group. Every single hotel brand's now opening up. We're developing the Shore Club with the Bears Resorts collection. Uh, you have you know, Bulgari coming into the market. You have Amman coming into the market nearby. Um, it, it probably has had the biggest transformation moment of any city in the United States. From an arts perspective, I think Art Basel coming here 20 years ago really set the tone for what Miami is today from an art perspective. They went 
from very few art galleries to now hundreds of art galleries. You have multiple very prominent art institutions in addition to the ICA, which I personally think is the most, one of the most exciting contemporary art museums, not just in Miami and the United States. Their show, uh, Michelle Mayeris, was featured in the New York Times on a very important article. Uh, you also have other great museums like the Bass, like the Perez Museum, and so forth. So um, I think as you continue to see really, really uh, big collectors come in here through these financial services firm, law firms, all these different industries come here, you're going to continue to see a growth of the art scene here as those collectors come into this market, continue to be contributors. We see it at the IC Miami all the time. The amount of people on the board who are very prominent art collectors continues to grow by the month just because of how many people are moving into Miami and they continue to donate great works to the museum, um, contribute to great exhibitions at the museum like the you know, Michelle Abney show that's going on there right now. So, you know, as these people come in, you're gonna continue to see the art market here continue to grow. Um, historically, your Rembrandt's, Cezanne's, Rubens going back over the centuries, which artists of the greats do you personally love? Which artists of the greats do I love or which do I collect? <laughs> but um, so, uh, you know, look, going back to really the iconics, obviously I love Pablo Picasso. His use of figuration is really quite exciting. Um, looking at um, other artists, of course, Wilhelm de Kooning is a really exciting artist. Um, from a sculpture perspective, David Smith, whose work you can see at um, Storm King Art Center, his use of sculpture and scale is really quite fascinating. Um, looking to more contemporary artists, who I think will also end up being an icon in terms of his use of sculpture is Richard Serra and his use of, he almost creates these amazing mazes that are similar to her work in terms of scale, but in sculpture. I mean, they're iconic. I remember I went to one at uh, David's Warner Gallery and they really had to reinforce floors just to physically up, up, uphold his work because of how um, heavy they are. So, um, you know, those are some of my favorites. Sorry. I think we have time for two more questions. Hi. <laughs> Alex, uh, the question is for you. Could you talk about um, the very the very first artwork that you bought for your collection and talk about that journey and how did you decide to do it? Sure. Well, the first work I actually bought for my collection was Sterling Ruby. It was a window painting after we had um, you know commissioned his sculpture at the West Hollywood edition. But given I talked to that, I'll transition to another work, which was the first work I bought at Basel, which I actually talked about. Uh, for the interview with Sarah on her amazing uh, profile in Cultured Magazine. Uh, so my, I actually only bought an Art Basel actually twice, usually by right before, right after. I always believe sometimes the best work at Art Basel are usually actually pre-sold. But I bought an artist, Alicia Kuwait, who's a really exciting uh, Berlin artist um, whose work I was really fascinated by. So I bought a series of hers which was called Rain. I was showing at the uh, Gagosian and Jeffrey Deitch show in the design district. Um, and what she does with the rain is she quantifies rainfall that falls on her surface over a period of time, and she measures them with measuring sticks. And then each one, mine was actually called one hour. So then she quantifies that with minute clocks. So, and the whole surface is uh, gold um, minute clocks combined with the measuring sticks that quantifies the rain over that surface over a period of time. And visually, it creates this really beautiful um, you know, canvas that glistens with the gold and it reflects sunlight. So that's the most exciting work I actually think I bought during Basel. Okay, I think we have a question over here. Okay, my question is for Andrea. You mentioned that some of the work never leaves the studio and I was wondering how you make that decision. Are you curating as you go? Are you editing the work or are other people helping you make that decision of when a work goes into a show, goes into the world, and when you just archive it in your studio? That's a good question. Um, is this working? Yeah, there it is. Okay. <laughs> um, I love making shows. I, I, um, especially when I know 
this particular show, when I knew the space, um, I'm already imagining how it is I'm gonna work with the architecture and the culture and the history of the space. And so um, I really have an idea of how I want the narrative of the show to, to work out. I mean, it doesn't always work out that way. But um, so I think when all is said, said and done, I'm really um, orchestrating and composing my shows. And so I'll know towards the end uh, what shouldn't uh, exist in that in that story that I'm trying to tell, and I'll, I'll hold work back. But for the most part, my work does not, my studio does not have like just paintings laying around. I am really adverse to that. Um, I make work, and if it's something that I want the world to see, it's out of my studio. If I'm holding on to it for more than like a month, I'm painting over it, or it's moving on to a new direction. But um, I, there's something about the nostalgia of having old work around that doesn't work for me. I need my work to be clean and in the present and very, like, yeah, very in the moment. Minimalist, I guess. Any last questions? Okay, I think we're good. Thank you all for joining. Um, this is really fun. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you, Alex. Um, you are welcome to stick around and mingle for a bit. Andrea will be open for more difficult questions. Alex will be available for easy ones. Um, yeah, have a great rest of your week, everyone. <laughs>